We've got uh, several areas of ministry with Grace and Truth. We're on seven television stations around the country in Queens, New York, Chicago, Nashville, Fort Wayne, Indiana, uh, Fort Worth, Texas. Na uh, we're on here in Hendersonville. And we're on in St. Augustine, Florida. And we're reaching several million people with this message here. We also send tapes to seven different prisons. And we've got a couple of the guys from Grace and Truth Ministries goes out here to Riverbend Maximum Security Prison in Nashville. And we've got a lot of dear brothers out there. And this morning I read a letter from Bill Cross that he had written to me. And, and James Tweedy is a dear black brother out there. And he wrote this letter to Glenn. And we read one of his letters last week. But if you guys out there in the prison write to us and tell us how these, this message is affecting you, we'll really appreciate it. I'm going to read the letter that we got from uh, James Tweedy. He's just a real sweet, gentle guy. Dear Glenn, please do not be mad because I didn't answer your letter when they moved me from the high side to Unit 5. The high side is Unit 1, 2, and 3. And, uh, uh, and then uh, he says to Unit 5, they was in such a hurry to move me, I left your letter plus a 30-page scrapbook that was full of old stars and new ones. The front and back of each page, I had planned to give it to my youngest son so that he would have some idea of how the times have changed. Glenn, I was really surprised when I put the tape in and Jim said he was going to read my letter that I wrote to him. As I told Jim, I reported Dr. Donald Boatwright to the medical board because he is the first doctor that I've been that I have seen ignored the fact that a person has a problem and and refused to see that it is treated. But I am only going to let God handle it. Also, as I told Jim, I didn't make a habit of suing anyone. He's been having some problems. He thinks he may have cancer, and he's really been having a hard time getting them to do a biopsy on him. But the inmates have no other choice in order to keep this TDOC or <coughs> Tennessee Department of Corrections honest because they walk all over the inmates. They are scared to stand up to them. After this, in, after this is in the works, I will need to get them in court because they charged me with a trumped-up charge of assault, and James is so such a gentle guy, you just can't, I couldn't picture him assaulting a guard, and add 30% time on the date that I could go up for parole and change it from 1996 up to the year 2002. That is six years. I was taken out to court because I didn't touch the officer. I was inside the cell and he was on the outside. He tried to push a paper through the pie hole and I pushed it back. It's a little bitty, little bitty hole. I've gone up and talked to some of the guys. You have to squat down and talk to them. And never touched him, but he lied and said that I made a place on his hand and forearm. And it's really amazing if you if they even touch one of those guards accidentally, they'll they'll charge him with uh, assault, and they may get another five or six years. Glenn, I guess that is enough about my problems. How are you getting along? Fine, I hope. I really miss seeing you at our Bible studies, Glenn. I received a letter from one of my good friends up Northeast Correctional Center that one of homeboys was killed up there a while back. Probably one of the guys from down here at Riverbend, I imagine. His, his mother was a good friend to my wife and I. I am having to get your address from Ron Collier. <clears throat> Ron's a rather real good friend of ours. So whenever I am moved to Northeast, I drop you a line so we can stay in touch. Love, Twitty. If you get out there and get with those guys, I know, I'm know i going to tell you something those, that the people out there don't understand. We go out there and we talk truth, and, and we're all hugging on one another, and they all had gathered down at the front after I got through, and it just happened naturally. And we'll get in there and just hug on each other, and they'll hug, and it's like your long-lost brother from home, and the guards will just kind of stand back, kind of cock their heads like, and they never say nothing. And when, I'm walk, when I'd be walking back up, uh, boy, we'd just be preaching out and hugging on each other and loving one another. And, you know, it's really amazing that some of those guys really love the Lord. And, and those guards don't have any idea what we're talking about. They're just, the correctional officers are looking at us like, 
Like, I wonder why, why y'all, why can you guys on the outside be so close to those guys? And it's because Jesus breaks all the barriers and all the boundary lines. But we love those guys. We have so many dear friends out there. And God's really, you know, I don't believe sometimes, I don't believe that the correctional officers and some of the system out there actually believe those guys' hearts are changing. And Gary Mays is as different uh, <clears throat> as the other guys in prison is daylight and dark. The man just loves Jesus. And Ron Collier is the same way. Just just sweet, gentle guys. And God's dealt with them. They'll tell you, hey, I was a mean man when I came in here. Gary May said I, the world was killing me. And now all he wants to do every time you get him on the phone is talk about predestination. <laughs> I mean, just he just takes off into it. He gets into the Bible. And we dive in, and that's our whole conversation for 20 minutes while we're on the phone. I love those guys. We're in one of the most complex studies. I'm going to really try to slow down. I said this several times. I'm going to try to slow down on this this Sunday night, and I'm going to go back and review some things because we're talking about we're talking about the number seven. Seven is the number of refinement to the saints. It's the refinement of the church of the church. It's the refinement of the church or spiritual Israel, or Israel. Now, I want us to go back. And why did God bring judgments upon the world? Why did he bring it upon his people? I'm going to try to say to you tonight and give to you why God is going to cause America to plunge to the bottom. I believe America is on the way down. Now, people say, boy, that's negative. I heard my ignorant brother on TV the other day say, well, we're not prophets of doom. We're prophets of something or another. Well, I'm a prophet to tell you, I'm here to tell you that God says that doom is coming to the unbeliever. Yes, sir, we're prophets of doom, but we're prophets of hope to the believer. And the hope is that God's going to refine the church. And we just got through singing the lily of the valley that there's a wall of fire about me. And that wall comes in the form of the eyes of the Lord. And we've already said this so many times, that the human eye is a wheel, or the iris, that's the little uh, outer part of your eye, that the iris of the eye, the round part of the eye, that surrounds the pupil. The pupil is the opening where all the light goes into your eye. The Bible speaks of God's eye, and he speaks of God's people being the center of his eye. The whole point, the whole point of God saying in the second chapter, in the second chapter of Zechariah, he said, anyone that touches Israel touches the apple of my eye. And that word apple is the word babal, B-A-B-A-H. And it means pupil. Now, God's got a, this picture of the eye. This picture of the eye is a picture of our protection. And here is why. He said, Israel's the pupil. And uh, Rich asked me here last week, he said, why did they call it the apple of the eye? Well, it was an old ancient custom for the king to go through town in a cart. And he had special favored subjects in his kingdom. And as he would travel through, he would look at them, and the ones that he saw that he showed special favor, he'd fix his eye upon them, and he'd carry a basket of apples, and he'd throw apples to them, the ones that he looked upon and he saw. Well, Christ says, we are the apple of his eye. We're the fruit of his eye is what we are. And <clears throat> the reason being that the pupil is the opening in the center of the eye, and that's where the light goes into the eye, doesn't it? Sure it does. And we've already gone through a study on the colors. We've been talking about the different colors. When you, when you see, you don't see shapes. I've said this so many times. What you see is the refraction of colors in the eye. When you see, I've said it before, but let me say it again. When you see the color red on this map over here, you see that red line, that's actually the color that's not in that map on those red lines, and that's the part that reflects back. When you see a color, what's clarified in your eye is the color that's not there. 
Now, I don't know how else to explain that. I've read that, and Eric's talked to me about it, and I've read it in some other books. But when you see a color, that's the part that's not there. That's what reflects back to your eye, and that's what causes us to see shapes. So you don't see a line. That's not what you see. You see colors, and didn't, doesn't Jesus say, didn't he tell us in Matthew, the fifth chapter, that ye are the light of the world? Well, if we're the light, what goes into the eye is light and refracts and causes the refraction or the reflection of colors in the eye, and that's what forms images, and that's what God sees and recognizes as his people. He recognizes us and he sees us and being that we're the light, he said, ye were darkness, but now are ye light. You remember the word, you remember the word hell. Remember the word hell. That in, uh, huh? And from hell. Yes. In the 16th chapter of Luke, that there was a rich man arrayed in purple and fine linen and he fared sumptuously. And that there was a beggar at his gate, laid at his gate full of swords. His name was Lazarus. And the beggar wanted the crumbs that fell from the rich man's table. And the rich man died. And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torment, seeing Lazarus in Abraham's bosom. He cried, Father Abraham, send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. And he said, No, remember thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and Lazarus evil things. Now he's comforted, thou art tormented. Besides this, there's a great gulf fixed. Now those who are in hell, they are in an eternal death. Let me explain this while we're at it. Here is heaven up here. Heaven. Here is hell down here. Hell. Hell. Now there's a great gulf fixed. It is fixed, and he said, so that those that are in hell cannot come to here, and those here cannot go to there. Now, when people say, well, Jesus went to hell and preached to the spirits in prison. First of all, the spirits in prison were the Gentiles because prison, as the word philoki, it means to be locked in darkness or light. We were in darkness for 2,000 years as Gentiles. Now we are in the light. Now Isaiah said, God will bring the Gentiles to your light. This word Great gulf fixed. There's a great gulf fixed, the scripture tells us in the 16th chapter of Luke. And that and the word gulf is the word C-H-A-S-M-A. And that means it we get our word C-H-A-S-M, chasm or chasm. H-A-S-M. And the word death is the word T-H-A-N-A-T-O-S. Death. Death does not mean annihilation. Death means separation. According to your best scholars, Mr. Strong tells us in McLennan's and Strong that death means to be separated and it doesn't mean a cessation of the conscious mind. It doesn't mean a, a, a ceasing. It doesn't mean annihilation. The word thanatos is the word death and it has the same meaning. It means separation Separation from life and to be with God is life. So this is an eternal death and this man is dying and bearing his sins forever. So when there's a great gulf fix, those in hell are eternally, well you can't use the word existent because to exist means to have life. They're eternally dying and they're conscious of their dying, and they're eternally paying their own debt. So there's this, there's this chasm or chasma, and that's what that word means. Not only are they eternally dying, but that, the word hell, when he says, and in hell he lift up his eyes. Remember we said that in the center of the eye is the pupil. And the outer point, the outer portion of the eye is the iris, the iris, and that was considered, the iris was called the ancient goddess of the rainbow. And the very meaning of the word rainbow in Revelation 10 and 1 is the very word, the Greek word for the word rainbow is the word iris. Now, hell, when the scripture says, and in hell he left up his eyes, Hell is the word, 
H-A-D-E-S, and it comes from the construction of the word E-I-D-O. Now, the word Ido, when Nicodemus said to Jesus, he said, we, we know that you're come from God because no man can do these miracles that you do except you come from heaven. And he used this word, Ido, we know that means to see, to see and recognize. And then Jesus turned around and he said, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And he used the same word when Nicodemus said, we know you're come from God. Jesus turned right around and said, Unless a man is born again, he cannot see. Now, he said, Nicodemus, if you actually know this and you actually recognize truth in me, you're born again. So if Nicodemus meant what he said, he was a believer. And Paul said, he said, I, I, he said, I suffer for being an apostle, a preacher, and a teacher, for which things I also suffer. Therefore, I know whom I have believed. And he used that same word. Now, our word know that we normally call knowing, we say G-I-N-O-S-K-O, gnosko, and that comes from the word G-N-O-S-I-S, and that word gnosis is the word S-C-I-E-N-C-E, -E, and that means mathematical exactness or being positive. Now, we're not positive we're saved, because if we were positive, there'd be no believing. And without believing, believe is the, is the verb, faith is the noun, and without faith, it's impossible to please God. We have to believe, and what we recognize is the death of self. So, if the light goes into the eye, and that's what God sees, and that's what God sees... This word hell in the Greek is the word Hades. God doesn't see those people, does he? What he sees is what he recognizes. When he said he beheld the rich young ruler, do y'all know that that's the word Ido? That he loved him and he beheld him. And the rich young ruler walked away that day when Jesus said, go sell all that you have and give to the poor and come and follow me. Most people presume that the rich young ruler wasn't a believer. Somewhere along the way, he had to come to Christ because Jesus ido him. He recognized him. He beheld him and recognized him as one of his. That's proof. Not only that is proof, but the scripture says he loved him and he didn't use the word phileo, P-H-I-L-E-O. He used the word A-G-A-P-E-O, agapao, or it comes from the word agape. And agape is to walk in the commandment of God. And the scripture says, whom the Lord loveth, whom the Lord agapes, he chastens and scourges every son. That's also proof that the rich young ruler belonged to God. He said, if you're without chastisement, God don't love you because you don't belong to him. He beheld the rich young ruler and he also gave him his agape. So somewhere in his life he had to come to the knowledge of Christ and he ido him, he beheld him. And he never said that about evil men. Never said he beheld him, huh? What does Hades mean? It is the word aido. It's the word aido. You remember you place the alpha in front of a word and when you place the alpha in front of ido, the word Hades means the unseen. That's what it means. So, Jesus said, I don't recognize those people, hell. I don't see them. They're not in my pupil of my eye. They're not light. They are darkness. The place of the unseen receives the bow or the judgment of God, don't they? So, here's what's truly amazing. The picture of the eye is the place of refinement. That's where the light goes. And we said when the scripture said over there, when God saved eight souls in the flood, it's amazing to me, he said the fountains of the great deep were broken up, and the word fountain is the word A-Y-I-N, and it means an eye. An eye. It was as though, I asked my ophthalmologist one time, when God said, I was telling him about this, he said, that sounds really amazing. I said, when you punch somebody in the pupil of the eye, what happens? He said, the, he said, the, he said the iris begins to bend 
and he said the the he said the uh, the iris begins to bend and the pupil starts closing up and that's the bow of God God's bow protects and refines his people and we've said that he hung his bow upside down and that word bow when he put his bow on the cloud is the word Q E S H E T H Keseth and it means a war bow when they hung their bow this way they were at war they never hung their bow upside down when they were at war when they went it when it, when one army would attack another army and they were going to be at peace they'd hang that bow upside down when the war was over then when war started all the time they were at war they would hang it this way and then whenever they conquered their enemy they would break the bow and a broken bow was a sign of concession to your conquerors. So what God did, he reigned. It's as though the, when the fountains of the great deep are broken up, the people didn't have time. I've heard preachers say, well, they run up to the ark, go, no, no, let us in. No, they didn't. The greatest rivers in the world are the subterranean rivers under the earth. They say they're bigger than the Nile. They're bigger than the Amazon, certainly bigger than the Mississippi, and that the fountains of the great deep are the eyes of the Lord. He just broke up, and judgment came. Immediate. And it didn't, it didn't have time to start feeling the rain. There was more water came from beneath than came from above. It started fast, but that crust broke open just like a pie shell with a peach cobbler going, and there, it, judgment hit. It was because those people received the judgment of God. They were not seen. They were aido, or they're going to Hades or going to hell when they die. Now, I don't know if there were believers in the flood. Some believe that Methuselah was alive. He probably was alive, and he was certainly a believer, some of those in that lineage. So, what we're saying, the unseen receives the bow or the judgment of God. Now, we're talking about seven. The eyes of the Lord are in seven, aren't they? Seven all the way through the scriptures is the number of refinement and judgment. It's what's going to refine America. Seven, there's two things you need to keep in mind. Seven is the number of the refinement, refinement of the church, of, of the church, and 12 is the number, is the number of the complete church or the number of spiritual Israel. A lot of people hate that. Let me ask you something. They hate spiritual Israel. If I'm the temple of God and I'm a priest and a king and if I offer acceptable sacrifice without spot, without blemish, and I'm the house of God, and the house was called, that's what the Holy of Holies was called in the tabernacle. That was called the house of God. And inside the house was the Ark of the Covenant, and it was sprinkled with the blood of the, of the Lamb without spot and without blemish on the Day of Atonement. And if my heart is sprinkled with the blood of Christ, and if, if the flesh was the veil, and the flesh was the bread, and the bread is the body, and the body is the church, what temple am I a member of and what veil am I? And if the church is the seven candlesticks, is exactly, it's in the 20th chapter of Revelation, the first chapter, I don't understand if there's no spiritual Israel, what seven candlesticks are we as the church? And what veil are we? And what temple are we? Because the temple, this was called the temple here, this was called the house of God, the holy of holies. He says, you're God's house, you're the temple of God, we're the bread. There was a table of showbread on the northern side of the tabernacle. If we're the table of showbread, and if we offer prayers, which was the altar of incense, and if our hearts are sprinkled, and if the Word of God is written on fleshy tables of heart and no longer on tables of stone inside that Ark of the Covenant, what priest are we priests of? If it's not spiritual Israel. I tell you, that really just goes all over me when, he, when Paul says, Know ye not your bodies, the temple of the Holy Spirit, which ye are? And if any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. What's the temple of God? 
It had to do with the tabernacle in the wilderness as it was given to Moses on Mount Sinai. What are we if we're not the temple of God and we're not spiritual Israel? What priest am I? He said, he even said, this is what really gets me. Romans 8 and 29, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. God said, give me the firstborn of Israel for the priesthood. <laughs> That's what he said, didn't he? He certainly did. He said, now, to make it real easy for you, I'll substitute the Levites for all the firstborn. The official priests of Israel were the firstborns. We've been predestined to be priesthood of God. If that's not spiritualism, what's wrong with you people? I don't even understand that. If we're temples and we offer acceptable sacrifice, and we're said to be, we're said to faith is the hypostasis, and the word stasis comes from the word histome or sta'o, and that means upright. And the Old Testament equivalent of that word was talmium, which meant without blemish. And that's how the sacrifices were offered. And we're told to continue to be upright or without blemish. And there's no spiritual Israel. What priests are we and what sacrifice we offer in what temple? And what's the name of the kingdom? Isn't that ridiculous? It's ridiculous. Yes, we're spiritual Israel. And yes, we better be in the midst of God's eye. Because if we're not, when he said you're the light of the world, he's saying you're the colors in my eye. I see you and recognize the colors in you and he's predestined us to conform to the image of Christ. And the word image is E-I-K-O-N, icon. And it means the representation. And we've already said you don't see images, you see colors. We've already talked about the image of Christ in Revelation, the first chapter, Revelation, the 10th chapter, and Daniel, the 10th chapter, hadn't we? <clears throat> now, I'll be honest with you all. I don't understand why people hate. Uh, maybe you all don't know this, but most people just hate the idea of a spiritual Israel. Isn't that something? I thought maybe Paul and Teresa didn't know that, but they hate the idea. You go out here to some Baptist church or some church of Christ or some, and they'll say, oh, we're not spiritual Israel. Israel, Israel, the church, the church is a church. And you know what really amazes me over in the seventh chapter of Acts, when Stephen <coughs> was standing before the Sanhedrin, he said Christ was with Moses in, with the church in the wilderness. And he used the word ecclesia. I'll tell you, if somebody wants to talk about this, I wish they'd call me. So, what God does, he has a wall of fire. The wall of fire does two things. Those people who are the people of the unseen, you don't see, you don't see with the iris of the eye, do you? That was the war bow of God. That was the war bow of God. And when Christ comes back in Revelation, look at Revelation. Look at Revelation 7, 7. When Christ, no, 10, excuse me, not 7. Revelation 10. And this is Christ coming back. This is Christ coming back. Revelation 10. And I saw another mighty angel. Christ is called an angel of God many times. So another mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with a cloud and an iris. Now it says rainbow, but if we read the Greek word, it says iris. That's what it says. With an iris, or with a rainbow, was upon his head, and his feet was, as it were, the sun, and his feet as pillars of fire. And he has a little book in his hand, and he comes back. He cried with a loud voice, as when a lion roareth, and he is the lion of the tribe of Judah. And he's coming back as when a lion roars, and he lifts up his hand to heaven. In verse 5, and he puts one foot on the land, the other on the sea, and says, Time's going to be no longer. That's Jesus. And, he cut, this is the, and the context of this is the end of time. Now, I wanted just to read that to you again because rainbow is the word iris. It means the iris of the eye, and iris was the ancient goddess of the rainbow. One more time, what is these? What is these? Go back to, Revela go back to Revelation 1. Revelation 1, and let's read that last, last couple of verses down there in Revelation, the first chapter. 
Here is what God sees is what he loves. So when he looked at the rich young ruler and he loved him, he agaped him. Those that he does not see, they will go to hell. Those that he don't recognize. When you recognize somebody, what is it you recognize? That's right. And aren't you recognizing someone that you know and you have a relationship with and you've known before? You say, I know him. I recognize him. Well, I knew him when I was a little boy, when I was seven or eight years old, living over on such and such a street. You recognize them as someone you know. And Christ recognizes us as what he knows by the colors that come to his eye because he sees Christ in us. It's what he sees. Now look over here in in Revelation, the first chapter, we see the candlesticks. The candlesticks are God's eyes, and the candlesticks, let me just put it up here this way. I'm reviewing some things because I, don't, I didn't feel like I had really, when Mary said, well, what does Hades mean, or what does hell mean? I didn't feel like I had really made that clear because we need to really see this. Let me erase this right here. Those in hell are separated. They're in an eternal death, and this is a real place with a real happening. Now, now, the church, the seven candlesticks, seven candlesticks, I said that that was on the south side, that was on the south side of that, of that, of that temple of God. That was a 20 by 10 cubit. A cubit was about a foot and a half, so that's about uh, 30 by 15. And the, the house of God, or the holy of holies, was a 10 cubit by 10 cubit. Or that was 15 by 15. Now, the seven candlesticks, it sat on the south side of the temple, and, they, and this priest had to come in there, and they had to eat the bread. They, this bread on this table of showbread was called the bread of the face, or the bread of his presence, and they had to eat it facing the seven candlesticks. And these candlesticks are called the eyes of the Lord, or the face of God. And you know why something's called the face? <clears throat> because you have to look them into the eye. When you actually look someone in the eye, that's where you recognize them. You don't recognize a person. Uh, you, you'll see an old movie and somebody say, Hey, John, reach out and grab a guy. And he'll turn around and he'll be somebody else. You don't recognize them from the back. You recognize them from the face. And that's how God recognizes us. And this was called the bread. The church is called the bread. Yet they had to eat the bread facing the eyes of God or facing him. Why is that? Because we, we repent. When he causes us to turn, the word repent means to turn around and cause us to face him and be obedient to his words. We, we are born running away from God. And those that he's elected for obedience, those that are his that he's predestined from the foundation of the world, he chases them down and he says, you're mine, turn around here. And that's why Jeremiah said, turn thou me and I shall be turned. And the word repent means to be turned and face God. That's what it means. It don't mean to find an aisle and walk down an aisle. And after you find this aisle and you walk down it a dozen times, maybe you'll get saved, you know. No, that's not what he's talking about. So the seven candlesticks. Let me say it one more time. Seven candlesticks. All right. Seven candlesticks is the church. And let's read it here. It's the number of the refined church. And I believe when you really see the seven candlesticks... I don't believe you see the seven candlesticks. I don't believe that's what the church is right now. I believe the last three and a half years of the tribulation, that's the only revival we're going to see in the world. And that's when you come back to Christ and you face Christ. We're going to have to die for our testimony. I believe this message I preach one day, <clears throat> I believe that they'll kill me for it if I live to see the last three and a half years of tribulation. Because people hate the message I preach as it is. And you know what? I meant to tell you this this morning. Be, you remember we talked about the oil of gladness and how that, how that meant to leap for joy and we're anointed with the oil of gladness and how that when our name is cast out as evil. I, I meant to tell you this because I want you to understand. Sometimes you might not understand. I get real angry when people take God's word and trample it underfoot but Noveda was telling me the other day, he said, yeah, this guy said that Jim Brown this and that Jim Brown that. And I get to laugh and I get tickled and I just want to jump up and down. That really thrills me to hear that someone is angry at me for telling the truth. Because the Bible said, blessed are ye when men shall hate you 
when they reproach you and cast out your name as evil and separate you for their, from their company for the Son of Man's sake, he said, rejoice and leave for joy. And you know what? When somebody's laughing at you and making fun of you for taking a stand in truth, that's what you do. I get real thrilled. I get kind of tickled when somebody's mad at me for talking about the truth. Because you know why? I know they don't have any answers. So if you think I'm kind of goofy when you tell me somebody said this or that, I say, tell me some more. Tell me what they said. And I just want to tell them. That's good. They didn't like that, did they? <laughs> That's it. That's what it is. And it's a thrill to know you've said the truth and somebody's mad at you. One of the devil's children is mad at you and they have no answers. They don't have any answers. Let me tell you, there's no answers for God's Word. Now, let's look here. Seven candlesticks are God's eyes. Look here. He, John sees Jesus on the Sabbath, and he sees him standing in the midst of seven candlesticks in verse 12. And then he sees an image of Christ, and this is the image that he has of us. And he, and he goes on down here, and he says... In verse 20, the mystery of the seven stars, there were seven stars in the right hand of Christ. Let me explain this real, real. Let me explain this to you because all this is figurative speech. Let me explain this to you. There are seven, let me erase this and I'll kind of start over here. There are seven candlesticks. When we say candlesticks, when this Bible was translated in 1611, it was translated by King James, he had 53 of the best scholars in the world. When this was translated in 1611, what they used and what was commonly used was wax candlesticks. In the day that this book was written, in the first century, there was no such thing as wax candlesticks. What these were, were seven lamps. They were one lamp, they were beaten gold. Let me show you how this thing worked. I've got a picture of it over here. Look at it over here. Here's the star of David. It's in the center of the pupil of his eye when he said these seven, these seven candlesticks are the eye of the Lord. And if you look at the top from this kind of glory cloud, what you've got is you've got two triangles or you've got a picture of a hexagon. You've got a hexagon shape. You've got the star of David. When you're looking at the seven candlesticks, you've got one, two, three, three, four, five, six, seven, the seventh one is in the center, seven flames. When you connect those, it is actually hexagon. And we've said this before, what refracts the colors in the eye are the, is what we call the retina, and the retina is called, now what's really amazing, I wish we could find something by the doctor who discovered the cones in the eye because the eye is a layer of hundreds of thousands of hexagon shaped prisms and these hexagon shaped prisms hexagon and triangular shaped prisms refract all the colors of the rainbow that's what they do and they form the images of what Man sees, and that's what God sees in us. And when he sees beauty in us, you remember the word kalos? When we do good, K-A-L-O-S, unto him that knoweth to do good and doeth and not to him it is sin, that word kalos means beauty. It means to please God, please God. And when we die to self, that's because we're in the center of his eye, and in all of those, those hexagon-shaped prisms in the center of the eye, that's what clears up the color and refracts it and causes images to appear in Christ. And God has predestined us to conform to the image of Christ. And we see that image in colors in Revelation 1, Revelation 10, and Daniel, and Daniel 10. I'm, I'm, I'm going back and reviewing this. I hope maybe we can get a clearer picture of this. The word kalos, there's two words. There's two words for the word good. The word good that in James, the, fifth, the fourth chapter, the last verse, unto him that knoweth to do call loss. That's what we do for God. That's what's beautiful. And what we do that pleases him, it means to please God. And what pleases God is a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable, Romans 12 and 1. And that word acceptable is the word E-U, A-R-E-S-T-E-O. You arrest her, oh, and it comes from E-U, meaning well, and A-R-E-S-K-O. 
And what pleases God, that means to please, this means well-pleasing. And what is well-pleasing to God is the death of the flesh, and that's what he sees is his people dying to self, and that causes the beauty or the colors that God sees in us. There is the word agathos. We know that all things work together for good, agathos, and agathos is the things that God does in our life that causes us to die to self and be beautiful in his eyes. And God sees the color. These are the two key words for the word good. This is what God does. It don't matter if he has to break your neck, put you in a hospital. Whatever he has to do is good. We know that all things work together for good, and that is a word that means beneficial. And the reason it's beneficial is because he causes us to die to self and start performing coloss, which is beauty in his eyes. It's pleasing. Pleasing and beauty actually are related because they mean one and the same. We die to self. That's the beauty that God sees. It's beautiful in his eyes. That's the image of Christ. The death of the flesh. And isn't that what Jesus said I came to do? The will of him that sent me. Boy, I like that. Don't y'all like that Colossus and Agathos? Well, then the only good that he sees is himself. That's right. Mm-hmm. We've already said that. We've already said that if me and Glenn, if this was about 10 years ago and he was hustling cars and I was hustling real estate, and we knew each other, we'd be button heads. And I love this guy as much as anybody I know I've ever known in the world. More than me. <laughs> <laughs> but I love Glenn. He's like, he's like a brother that I, I never had a brother like him. And uh, <laughs> he's like a brother I never had. But that's what God sees. It. That's what God performs in us. And he causes us to do the coloss. And that's the beauty he sees. He sees the image of Christ in us. He sees a well-pleasing sacrifice. That's what he sees. That's what he beholds. And that's beauty in his eyes. Hope we get over that. Now, let's go, let's go back here. This is what I was going to show you. The seven candlesticks. They were lamps. They were beaten lamps. And they, I can't draw it good. That's better over there. It's a, it's a three-dimensional. It's not... The Jews have said, well, because it says there's three out of each side... They made it two dimensional, but like I said one night, if you've got if you've got the three dimensional one, two, three, four, five, six. If you got three dimensional and you draw a diameter anywhere in the middle of it, you got three out of each side. You see what I'm saying? You got three coming out of each side. This is what this is the candlestick you see on the Ark of Titus. It's three dimensional. It's not it's not like this. So when in Exodus it says it had three coming out of each side, this is what it was, and that's what forms from the Shekinah glory cloud. That's what forms the Star of David. And the, <coughs> the ancient rabbis said that David carried the menorah or the seven candlesticks on his shield, but this is what's called the shield of David, is what we call the Star of David or Magon David. This was called Shield of David. And as long as they were keep being obedient to all of the laws of God, they were not serving idol gods. <coughs> they were doing all of His law. Then they would go out and conquer their enemies. And that's what He said in Deuteronomy, the 28th chapter. But if they were not obedient to God, there were four judgments that He would bring. Four judgments that He would bring. And I'm going to get back to this in just a moment. I want to show you how the candlesticks were made. There were four judgments that God brought. He brought, he said this in the 29th chapter of uh, Jeremiah, and he says it over in the 14th chapter of Jeremiah, all through Jeremiah. He said, these four judgments are going to come on you. These four judgments. First, the sword. Famine. Famine. Pestilence. He had sent these three continually. He had sent them constantly upon Israel, saying, Obey me. Put down your idol gods. Get rid of the Hercules gods, the Baal gods. Get rid of the groves. Get rid of Venus. And they'd say no, and he kept bringing these. And finally, he would say, I've had my fill. He'd bring famine, and he'd starve them to death by the hundreds of thousands. He'd bring all kinds of disease and plague, and that's what's coming on America and the world right now. 
This is exactly what's coming. I'm reading a book I got from Debbie. It's called The Coming Plague. It's hair raising to know what's coming on the earth. They're talking about staph infections that they cannot cure in hospitals. They're saying impossible. They were feeding uh, Debbie taped uh, uh, something off CNN here recently, cable news network, and they were talking about they put they put some cultures in petri dishes, and this one lady that they couldn't make her well. They started, there was only one antibiotic that would affect the particular disease she had and they started giving this to her and they noticed that she kept getting worse and she wouldn't get better. And they took some of the culture out and put some of this virus on a petri dish and they put some of that and they had several other viruses and they put that particular, they put that particular uh, uh, antibiotic there with that culture and it began to fit those 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 viruses begin to feed off that antibiotic and they found that that was keeping the woman sick because viruses are mutating at such a quick rate they can mutate themselves into be, being able to not just merely ward off disease but to and ward off uh, ward off an antibiotic but to feed on it and I asked my, a druggist one time, I, I, asked, I asked him, I said, what is, why is it that we could get shots in 1950 and 51, get shots of penicillin, and it cures just overnight, just like that? He said, because viruses are like a bunch of mongrel dogs. He said they'd start mutating. But he says, viruses are like Oh, mongrel dogs, he said, they'll start breeding and inbreeding and they'll mutate and they'll keep mutating until they can fight off nearly anything. And according to these books and the research Debbie's been doing and the, and the works I've been studying, they're talking about just dozens and dozens of viruses in the world that they don't even know how to conquer. There's viruses that we don't even know is going on. They're uncovering them down in Brazil. They're uncovering them in Europe. Do you realize that the bubonic plague never did disappear? All it did was go undercover. All these ancient viruses, the old, uh, what are some of those old viruses, David? You remember some of them that was going on a thousand years ago, huh? They had some that were going on a thousand years ago that was Black killing plague. the Black Plague. That is not hidden. It's not gone. It just goes undercover. What's the tuberculosis, the TB? It's, none of it's disappeared. Diphtheria is already breaking out again in Europe. They had a thing of black plague that broke out in India a couple yeah. of weeks ago. What happens? Let me, I'll, take, I'll explain to you one of the plagues. And I'm talking about the pestilence that's coming. They're saying that there is going, they believe a staph infection is going to hit the hospitals. Huh? Oh. They believe a staph infection. They said they're waiting for a staph infection that's incurable to hit the hospitals. There's been people uh, coming down with some staph infections around in the area. My a friend, the mother knows uh, her husband just got. They just put him in the hospital. Really? He had a staph infection. Yeah. He's yeah. Still there. Yeah. Well, these staph infections are. They say are so bad, they're not even going to have cures for them. That the viruses are mutating at such a rate. Let me let me explain. One of the doctors said. He said, you know how viruses keep going? And we just think we've all got it together. We're putting all these plastic uh, pills into our bodies. And they're talking about how that if you don't take all of your prescription drugs, that, that, that the strongest viruses stay alive in you. You just kill off the less ones, and you become immune to the stronger ones, and they leave you and go somewhere else. And they may just keep on going and keep mutating for years, 20, 30, 40, 50 years. And they keep mutating. And what's happening is what we're doing is we're just, God just goes out there and he covers this pestilence up. I, in, in this book, in 1963, these doctors went down into Brazil. And to show you, it's as though God has got all of his layers. He's got, it's as though he's got layers of... Uh, it's kind of like he's got layers of lawfulness. And he says, I've got an, he said, I want you to operate up here. But man's greed, man's greed is destroying him. When man goes out here and he won't put emissions controls on these plants out here, 
what they're doing and they go ahead and dump in the river or dump in some lake, it's cheaper to pay the fine than it is to put the emissions control. So therefore, we end up burning up our ozone and then we start getting more and more cancer. God has a way of exposing us and it's as though he's saying, operate up here. If you operate under here, you're going to dig into one of my plagues. And they went down there into South America and some of the doctors in this book, The Coming Plague. This was in 63. These things, these things are not hidden. And we think one, one of these ignorant uh, uh, politicians said, well, we've conquered all the viruses back in the 1960s. <laughs> the man's got to be ignorant to say that. Because even the ones that they think they've conquered, that we think have been gone a thousand years, are still alive and well. It surfaces as something else. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Anyway, they went down there. And they put a big, uh, they put a big, well, like the Ebola virus, yeah. That's been, that's been hidden for a long time. That's not new. All these viruses are there. And what it is, it's God's pessimist. He said, what I do, I've got an operation. You live on the top. You live according to my law. And when you start peeling off the layers, I'll kill you. <clears throat> and that's exactly what God's doing. And they said that there were some factories down there that they'd go down there and built and they laid everybody off and moved the factories to somewhere else and the people started they they were hungry so they went out there and they started clearing off some of these marshes and they started in some of these lowlands and they started planting corn what they did is they took the habitat of these particular field mice away and all of a sudden people started just dying right and left this is in 1963 it was a virus, it was a plague that these mice could carry, didn't kill them, but it killed people and they would urinate on the corn and they would dig their way in these cornfields. That was their habitat and when we start destroying the earth, we're peeling away the layers and God says, under here I've got disease. That's supposed to be there, leave it alone. And they said they couldn't figure out. And when you got this virus in 1963, they had no cures for it, and you died in about two weeks. You're dead. Finally, they found out that, that the, these mice were urinating on this, on this corn. They were digging their ways in their shacks, and they had uncovered their habitat. And see, man hasn't learned to live with what God has given him. He won't live. He won't live, a, live like he should live. And what happens when man gets greedy, God says... When you start getting greedy and you won't live by my laws and you start seeking self, I'll send pestilence. And according to this book on the coming plague, we've got so many pestilence and plagues out there. All we've got to do is wait for God to bring them. The black plague is not dead. Bubonic plague is not dead. Smallpox is not gone. Diphtheria is not gone. It's still here. It's lurking there, waiting to come out. And, and according to the writers, according to that one tape that Debbie did on took off of CNN, they're talking about a deluge of pestilence that's on the way. And God said, when, when my people, when they go out here and they get disobedient to me, you say, but we're not worshiping idols like Israel was. Oh, yes, we are. Yes, we are. Didn't Paul say, covetousness is idolatry? Just a different huh? It doesn't matter. Covetous, that word covetous, I've said this so many times. Do y'all realize this is the idol that he's going to destroy America for? Because he said covetousness, and that word covetousness is the word pleonectes. And here's what God's going to kill us for right here. The word covetous means want more. It's that man in the mirror that he's going to kill us for worshiping. He's going to devastate America and send pestilence and send famine upon the world. And it's on the way already. We've got a billion Chinese we don't know how to feed. We've already got, we've got... They figured that problem out. Huh? That in the paper. Uh, they, in the, I think it was Friday's paper. Yeah. They had a thing about abortion this guy found about. And the Chinese, they're aborting the babies and they're <coughs> eating the aborted babies. They are. Oh, Lord. And they only allow them to have one baby for family, isn't it? Not anymore. Really? They want to have as many as they want. If they abort them, that's food. 
Man, isn't that unbelievable? You know what that's called? Cannibalism. That's Baal worship is what it is. It goes all the way back to the prophets of Baal or the priests of Baal. Priest is Kahan and Baal. Kahan Baals are cannibals. They ate human flesh off their altars and that's God will devastate this world. I believe we're fixing to see. I keep telling Glenn, I say something's about to happen. This nation is about to collapse and it's about to go under. It's going to happen. We're already going on five trillion dollars in debt. Even the best economists say it's impossible to take every tax that America can pay on all the food, all the income taxes. It would take 200% of every tax that we can charge every individual and just to pay the interest. And it's growing at such a rate we can't do that much longer. This nation is in trouble. And you say, Jim, are you trying to scare us? Yes. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and knowledge. We better get afraid of God. He's not going to put up with this much longer. I believe America is going to go down and hit the bottom so hard and, and the elect sheep of God are going to come out of this harlot of Babylon. And they're going to recognize and say, Oh God, what have we done? And they're going to throw themselves on the mercy of God. I want to throw myself on His mercy right now. I am so afraid of this God that we serve. Let me just give you this and we'll stop. I'm, I really want you to see this. When I keep saying covetousness is idolatry, I want you to understand what does God do for idol worship? What did he do to Israel? He scattered all over the face of the earth. He killed Hitler was just the last sword in God's hand to slaughter the Jews. David said, Deliver me from the wicked, which is thy sword in thy hand. And when Hitler's killed six million Jews, that was the hand of God. That was the last of God's swords until they became a nation in 1948. And they became a nation again. And God said in, in, in Luke 21 and 20, 24, he says, or it goes, starts in verse 20. He said, when you see Jerusalem encamped by armies, know that the desolation thereof is nigh. And for 2,600 years they've been encamped by armies. And he said, let those which are in Judea flee for their lives and don't go back in Jerusalem. Because this is the days of God's revenge that all things which are written may be fulfilled. And then it goes on to say, and those that are with, that are with child and, and give suck in those days, he said, run for your life. Let's pray that your flight be not in winter because this is God's devastation upon Israel. And then he said in verse 24, he said, they, the Jews, will fall by the edge of the sword and they'll be led away captive into all nations and Jerusalem will be trodden down to the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. That's right now. And he said, this is the generation that's not going to pass until all be fulfilled. Here's the whole point. We're living in the generation when everything is going to be fulfilled. I believe these kids will see the coming of the Lord. I believe they'll be alive and well and they won't be old at when he splits the skies one into the other because we're living in the generation when the Gentile rule over the Jews is done and it's when Jerusalem comes back and when the Jews no longer are ruled by the Gentiles when the Jews begin to open their eyes and they begin to flow back to, to Israel he said this is, this is the generation here's the whole point that's also the generation of the greatest pestilence and famine and the sword against God's people that's ever been. And it's also the generation of the beast. And the beast, according to the 13th chapter of Revelation and according to Daniel, the 7th chapter, is the world ruling empire, or should I say it, the world order. That's what it always was. huh? It's the new world order. It was an empire... And when we see the we see the we see the the first beast that rises up out of the sea, and it rose up out of the sea, and in every one of these empires had their had their boundary lines up on the great sea, and it's talking about this great sea or the Mediterranean. And we see the first one was Babylon, and all of her borders were on the Mediterranean Sea. And we see She's represented in the form of a lion, and then we see she's overthrown by the bear, and the greatest, that's the largest carnivore in the world. It's the greatest devourer of all other animals, the, the biologists tell us. And she is the most powerful of all the carnivorous, carnivorous animals. And the bear slew the lion, and it was Persia that was a picture of the bear, and she 
went sweeping through the land with two and a half million in her army, the most powerful army that existed. And then the leopard came along and slew the bear. And the leopard was the picture of Greece, which had her borders and boundary lines, the Grecian Empire on all the Mediterranean Sea. And we see her rising up out of the sea. That's where we get the beast system. And then the fourth was a composite of all those three, and that was the Roman Empire rising up out of the sea, the Mediterranean Sea. And at the end of time, we've seen that same system. We see the lion, the bear, and the leopard in Revelation, the 13th chapter. And that is going to be a new world empire ruling the world, and they're talking about that right now. One of these days, we might get up. We might turn the TV on. They say, well, America's gone into a state of bankruptcy, and the United Nations has stepped in, and they're going to be ruling from now on. You don't have any more constitutional rights. You have no more civil rights. You don't even own your house anymore. Uh-oh, boy, we ain't going to like that, are we? Bankrupt. That would be good, though. Everybody be equal. Yeah, wouldn't it? Wouldn't it? Of course, they're going to take what we got and give it to the evil people. And those of us that are believers are going to say, you Christians, you're causing more problems for us, and they're going to think they do God's service. We've got billions of people in the world to feed. We're going to have to put you in jail or kill you. And you know what? That's going to look, from the viewpoint of the world, as a righteous thing to keep us from taking a stand against all this sin that's going on. It's the same system of famine and pestilence that's going to be going on. I wanted to give you this just before we quit. Look here at the eyes of the Lord. What goes into God's eyes, what He sees and what He beholds. The eyes of the Lord is the candlesticks. The candlesticks, and when you had candlesticks, you didn't have, here's the whole point. You didn't have wax. These were, I can't draw those good. Uh, and they, it was a, uh, I'm not very good at this. They came in, but anyway, what it was, these were hollow. It was made of beaten gold, and inside was the oil, and oil is always a picture of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. These were not wax candlesticks. So there's two parts to a candlestick in order to get the flame on top. In order to get the flame on top, you had to have the, you had to have the candlestick, and the oil in the candlesticks. Now, now let's go back here and read here in the first chapter of Revelation. There's two parts to it. The spirit and the candlestick. Well, notice what the candlesticks are. I don't think I've ever really clarified this. I've, I've kind of talked at it, but let's just clarify this and we'll come back next week. Look here in Revelation 1. Revelation 1. And look at this and let's read this. Now, 7, God said he would multiply... All of Israel's transgressions times seven. He said, for every sin I'll multiply it times seven. Now look here in the first chapter, the first chapter, the 20th verse, the mystery of the seven stars. Now you remember the stars of heaven are going to fall to the earth. We find seven trumpets that are being sounded by seven angels and the word angel is the word angelos or messenger. Right? So, here's what I want you to see. You're going to find seven stars. You're going to see seven angels. Seven spirits. These are all the same. And when you see the stars of heaven fall to the earth, you see the message of the seven angels or the seven spirits or you see the message of the church that pronounced judgment on the world. That's what you see. Look here. Let's read it here. The mystery of the seven stars that was in the right hand of Christ, which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks, they go together. One is the oil inside the candlestick and the other is the candlestick. Read it. The seven stars are the angels. The angels, now, now anytime you find angels having seven trumpets later on, trumpets always sounded judgment. 
in the 8th, ninth, and 10th chapters of Revelation, you'll see seven angels with seven trumpets. The word angel is the word A-G-G-E-L-O-S. A-G-G-E-L-O-S. And Paul called the pastors of the churches angels. It just means a messenger. It's what it means. And seven is the number of the refined church. So at the end of time, as the church has been refined, it will be the candlesticks pronouncing the judgment of God, which is a picture of the oil inside the candlesticks. Now read the rest of this with me. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. And there's more, more than seven churches in Asia, which is what we call Turkey. The angels of the seven churches merely is picturing, it's a picture of the preachers of the refined church. And that's every one of us. That's what it's talking about. And the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. You see what I'm saying? So when we find the stars of heaven, let me just show you this quickly. I, I brought it out before, but go over to Revelation 8. Go to Revelation 8. Look at Revelation 8. Look at verse 1. And when he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. And I've been wrestling with that for years. And I don't mind telling you, I ain't never heard anybody that had a good explanation for that. And I saw the seven angels. Who are the seven angels? Huh? Well, the seven angels are the seven stars, aren't they? Huh? Sure they are. And, the, and the, that's a picture of the Holy Spirit in us. That's the seven spirits. That's the picture of the Holy Spirit in each one of us, which we are the candlesticks. And I saw seven angels who stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. What are seven trumpets used for? Sounding judgment. Remember over there in the book of Joshua? They walked around the city seven times for seven, or walked around the city every day uh, for seven days. And the seventh day, they walked around seven times and they took seven trumpets and the priests sounded them and they shouted and the walls of Jericho fell down. Judgment came on the sounding of the seven trumpets, didn't it? Same picture as here. And the seven trumpets are just a picture of the church sounding judgment and the angels <coughs> are the picture of the Holy Spirit inside the candlesticks. And that's the church, isn't it? That's the picture of the angels or the Holy Spirit. Because he, they're called the seven spirits before the throne of God in the fourth chapter of Revelation. The seven, and when you see the seven spirits, the seven angels are the seven stars. Those are in the right hand of Christ. They go with the seven candlesticks. So how can the church not be here if these stars of heaven are falling to earth? It's not talking about literal stars falling down because he starts going down through here and he talks about the first angel sounded in verse 7. The second angel sounds in verse 8. And he says, and look here at verse 10. And the third angel sounded and there fell a great star from heaven. What are the seven stars? The seven angels in the right hand of Christ in the first chapter. When he defines this for you, don't go throwing it away. Don't make up some new seven angels and some new seven trumpets and some new seven messengers. These angels, when he defined this for us in the first chapter, he is expecting us to keep these definitions all the way through the book. Wouldn't it, wouldn't it since God said, I change not. And he's always the same. Therefore, he's not going to have a different set of seven angels or a different set sounding different seven trumpets. You understand what I'm saying? He's going to have the same seven angels that he sees in the right hand of Christ, and that is the Holy Spirit in the refined church. That's what it is. Because the seven candlesticks is a picture of the church during the last three and a half years because it's going to be refined. It's not refined now. We can't picture the church as the seven candlesticks right now. Only those of us who are refined. Then we're a part of that candlesticks. But when that starts happening in the last three and a half years of the tribulation, you can't separate. When, he, when he's talking about the stars of heaven falling to earth in that sixth chapter and over in the 24th chapter of Matthew, it's talking about these seven stars in the right hand of Christ, which is a picture of the Holy Spirit. It's a picture of judgment coming from the mouth of the church or truth, and the Holy Spirit is truth, and He lives in us. 
And it's a picture of us speaking out judgment. Every one of these, these angels opening these seven seals is a picture of us pronouncing judgment. That's what it's a picture of. In fact, if you look down there in, in verse nine, chapter 9, verse 1, And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star from heaven fall from heaven into the earth, and to him was given a key of the bottomless pit. And we said the word bottomless pit doesn't mean a big hole in the ground. I'm not going to go through that. The word bottomless pit is the word abusos, and it means a place for a bottomless sea, and the woman sits upon the seas, and she sits upon the beast, and the beast, which is a world-ruling system, rises up out of the sea. He also is said to rise up out of the bottomless pit. We know that the new world order is not going to rise up out of a hole in the ground. Don't we? Is it? Y'all understand what I'm saying there? If the beast comes up out of the sea, and the woman sits on the sea, and a, and a bottomless pit is the word abusos or abyss, and it means a sea with no bottom, the woman sits up on the waters, and the waters that she sits upon are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. That is the harlot of Babylon where she sits. So when, when she comes rising up out of the sea, when the beast comes up out of the sea, and he also comes up out of the bottomless pit in Revelation 11, it's talking about the peoples of the world. So when you, when you get this definition, and it, that's what he's saying, when he says, the fifth angel sounded, I saw a star fall from heaven. There's another one of the, that's the Holy Spirit falling upon the world from the mouth, out of the mouth of the candlesticks of the refined church. Now let's go over here one, just one more time. Let's go back over here. I'm going to, what I'm going to do next week, I'm going to come back and we're going to go through the seven seals, the seven, the seven trumpets, and the seven vials. We'll go through that next week. I know that's hard to understand. When you're thinking of seven, when you're thinking of sevens, you can't change. Mary, this is a figurative picture. Seven has to be the number refinement. It cannot change. The seven candlesticks are the eyes of the Lord. Look at it one more time. Zechariah. If the seven candlesticks are the church, it's the refined church, and then you go over to Zechariah, if it's the eyes of the Lord, here's the whole point. Israel is the eyes of the Lord, aren't they? Yeah. Yes, sir. It's because they're the light that goes into the pupil. They're the light that goes into the pupil. So if the seven candlesticks are the church, and the church is spiritual Israel... That's what God sees, Ido, and what is in hell is Ido, what he doesn't see. They receive the bow of God. We do not. We have a wall of fire around us. And that's what he says right here. Look at this. Zechariah 4 and 10. The church, the refined church during the last three and a half years of tribulation when the world attacks us and kills us for our testimony, and they will do that. That's going to happen. That is the same picture here in Zechariah 4 and 10 when he says, Who hath despised the day of small things? For they shall rejoice and see the plummet. And a plummet is a plumb line and that measures. And the word predestinate means the, the what's so great. Here's what's so great. The word predestinate is the word prohorizo and it means to prehorizon or predetermined to put inside the light. Pre-lighten. And those who are in the darkness receive the judgment of God because he doesn't see them. They receive the bow of God. That's what they receive. And then he says, because our predestination is to be inside this horizon right here, to be in the pupil. So, he says right here, these seven, he's talking about the seven candlesticks that, that Zerubbabel sees in verse 2 and 3. He said, these seven candlesticks are the eyes of the Lord which run to and fro through the whole earth. And he said in 2 Chronicles 16 and 9 that the eyes of the Lord go to and fro throughout the whole earth, showing himself strong in behalf of those whose hearts are perfect towards him. The church goes throughout the earth. And we show ourselves strong in behalf of those who God has chosen, whose hearts are perfect. And we as the church declare the judgment of God and we declare the Holy Spirit that's in us. We declare truth and that's the picture of what's inside the candlesticks or the oil. Well, I'm going to stop here, and I'm going to come back next week. The seven of the eyes of the Lord, the seven candlesticks of the church, and it's what goes into the eye. If y'all understand that, the seven candlesticks, if they're the eye, 
ten of six, or the eye. And the church is in the midst of God's eye. And the church is the seventh candlesticks. They have to be the same because they go in the midst. The only, what's the purpose of the eye? To see, isn't it? And that's what goes in the pupil. And he said, when he said it over there in chapter 2 of Zechariah, verse 8, He that toucheth you, Israel, toucheth the apple of his eye, or touches the pupil of his eye. So when he says the seven candlesticks are the eyes of the Lord, he's talking about the seven candlesticks are in the pupil because they're the church. You see what I'm saying? Y'all go. <laughs> Put your head sideways. Well, we're going to come back next week. I'm going to go through. I'm still, I'll be honest with y'all, I'm still working on a lot of the colors. We said that red was the color of baptism. It was certainly the color of the pitch. When the Lord told Moses, uh, Moses told Noah to pitch the ark within and without with pitch, the word pitch means to cover all over with a red stain or dye, and that's what baptism, it means to cover us with the blood of Christ. And, and that's what the red was. When you cross the red with the yellow, yellow was the fovea that was in the middle of the eye, and that's one of the main cones, one of the main uh, hexagonal shaped cones. And when you cross red with yellow, you get orange or gold. And gold is the color of mature fruit. And that's what we have in Galatians 5.22, the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, etc. We're going to stop. I'm going to go. Th I'm going to come back next week. And if I don't have, if I have to, I'm just going to read the eighth, ninth, and tenth chapters, and maybe some of the eleventh chapter of Revelation, and go through it and talk with you and discuss the seven. Sevens never change. Since God never changes, sevens the numbers are always going to be the same. 12s are going to be the same everywhere you find them. 7s are going to be the same. 6s are going to be the same. 2s are going to be the same. 3s are going to be the same. That's always going to be Trinity. 2s are always going to be second born, second birth. 6 is always going to be the number of men. 7 is always going to be the number of refined perfection of the church. 12 is always going to be the number of the complete church. And it goes on and on. 5 is always going to be the number of grace. Every time you find it. I've got a book by uh, E.W. Bullinger. Now, he goes really crazy with these numbers. <laughs> but uh, he's got some real interesting things, real interesting things about how God has got everything arranged exactly in nature. And I may read some things from that next week. I've read some before. He, he, tells, us that, he tells us that on every leaf of every tree that there'll be a, that when a, the first leaf grows out, that so many turns... And, it'll, and you'll have it line up exactly again with that first leaf. It'll be exact alignment with it. And he said in some trees, he'd name them. The peach tree, it might be every fourth turn. In the pear tree, it might be every eighth turn. He'll, he tells you exactly. I can't remember what they are. And then some trees, he said, you, go, you turn like 21 times, and that leaf will align exactly on the limb with that tree. We're talking about a God that's exact. I don't know if you knew that, Paul. But... Uh, but that's interesting to know that God has got an exact orderly arrangement in nature and when you find all these numbers Mary has a hard time with this but you've got to understand God has these numbers set out in an exact order and we don't ever want to set any of them aside if you have a hard time understanding it just think of it as figurative don't try to get it literal in your mind think of it figurative well let's pray and we'll come back next week I'm going to talk about the seven seals, the seven trumpets, and the seven vials. Father, we thank you for your truth. God, help us to see and understand that we're in the middle of your eye, that we are your eyes and we're to pronounce your judgment to the world. Lord, as we pronounce your judgment, Lord, cause us to be strong in you and in the power of your might. Lord, we're not able to strengthen ourselves. God, we know pestilence is coming. It's here, Lord. Famine is on the way, and we know that you're going to raise up enemies against this nation. God, it's a scary thing to know that judgment's going to come. But, Lord, we know that our hope is in you. And, Lord, if this thing collapses tomorrow, or whenever it does, and these children are sure to see the collapse of this system, God, give us strength to stand and to be bold enough to see that there's nothing worth living for in this world. That we'll die to the flesh. And Lord, we'll give up to you and surrender to you. 
We'll yield ourselves to you and we'll pronounce your name and your word and your authority and we'll do it in boldness. And give us the strength to even do that right now. We'll give you the praise and glory for everything in Christ's name. Amen.